Hmm? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This afternoon, as the second in the series of our distinguished lectures, Dr. Furlong, a distinguished engineer, consultant in the field of transportation, will make our distinguished presentation. He is a graduate of the University of the West Indies and of one of the distinguished IITs in India, where he did his PhD. He has more than 36 years of practice as an engineer and has practiced his art throughout the Anglophone Caribbean. I hope that today what we have is in fact a distinguished submission by a distinguished scholar and engineer. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. And I know in some places it might be good night, good evening. So the title of the, my presentation, Prioritization for National Land Transportation Infrastructure Projects, a Systematic Approach. So I'll give a background to the presentation, then it will be followed by a, a brief discussion on national transit. Uh, I'll get in some more into road management and maintenance, and then the meat of my presentation will be a decision support tool for prioritization of the national transportation projects. The reason I've put in a bit on transit and the background on where we are with respect to mobility, as well as the road um, maintenance and management. So it's because you can have projects in all these areas. So I just threw some of them in so that um, to give a, a sense. So background to the presentation. Until 1993, the imported used car industry commonly called in our area foreign used cars and in some of the other islands, the Skettel car did not exist in the Caribbean. Japan's strict motor vehicle inspections and high depreciation, in addition to its stringent vehicle emission test standards, make vehicle disposal very expensive. So the imported used car dealers have been able to grab these used cars at very low cost and in good condition for nearly 30 years. What has happened? Successive governments have boasted of one, providing cheap cars for the common man, and two, 
generation of revenue from taxes on these imported vehicles. So our territories have been struggling to meet the increased demand for foreign exchange, for fuel, and for importing these vehicles. Also, the increasing annual expenditure on road capacity improvements and the road maintenance. Long delays as well because of the associated traffic congestion, lack of parking opportunities, and increased traffic accidents. Making matters worse is the fact that we often see vehicles on the road with single occupants. In addition, carbon emissions from automobile exhaust are a major source of air pollution. Vehicle safety and fuel standards of these wide range of vehicles, of used, of imported used vehicles are impossible to monitor. National transit. We have the automobile domination as a result of what I just said. But most people will simply not give up the comfort and convenience of their cars, except if penalties are imposed on them to coerce them to change their mode of transport. Regardless of the degree of car ownership, there will always be a significant portion of the population who are unable to access a private car. And in our instance, a large proportion of women and children fall into that category. It is an advantage to a society who can offer high quality public transport services, especially for those not owning cars or who cannot or do not want to drive. The Public Service, service Transportation, the Public Transport Service Act, which created the Public Transport Service Corporation, better known as the PTSC in 1965, does not give them responsibility for taxis or maxi taxis. Also, the Transport Division of the Ministry of Works and Transport is responsible only for licensing and inspection of taxis and maxi taxis. So, in effect, in effect, nobody manages maxis and taxis. Therefore, a National Transit Authority has long been required to arrange all transit services, buses, maxis, taxis, in an appropriate manner. These services will involve sequencing desired levels of PTSE operations, together with contracting of the other services. We call them paratransit services, the taxis and the maxis, with appropriate regulations. There's, a, there's currently, as I understand it, an ongoing study for national for a national transit authority by a foreign consulting firm, firm. So I will say no more on this. There is to come a national transportation planning study, recently announced in the press. So I am sure the National Trans Transit Authority issues will be included. So we can we now come to road management. And maintenance. Traditionally, no allowance is made for progressive depreciation of capital assets such as bridges and roads. It is often said that the, the lifespan of a bridge is of the order of 60 years. Some of our bridges are close to that. Some of them in our interchanges have been prescribed for reconstruction. Reserve funds are not usually established for the orderly maintenance of these facilities. Consequently, as roads and roadways near the end of their design life, there are rarely sufficient funds for replacement or restoration. Hence, the recurring crises in infrastructure finance. We never have enough funds for management and maintenance. Road management experts throughout the world agree that adequate road operations and maintenance activity has an annual cost of between 
percent and 3.5 percent of the replacement value of the road depending on climate and traffic volumes. So let's talk a bit about the institutional arrangements with respect to the roads. In the Ministry of Works and Transport, you have the Highways Division, and they have traditionally been responsible for planning, design, construction, maintenance, repair of road network, the road network under the purview of the, the Minister for Highways. You have the program for upgrading roads efficiency, PURE. According to the website, it's a project management unit of the highways division. And PURE exists for achieving the strategic intent of the ministry in respect of road infrastructure. You also have the traffic management branch, TMB. According to the website, it falls under the highways division and is responsible for the management and control of traffic on the roadways. Then you have the National Infrastructure, the National Insurance Property Development Company Limited, NIPDEC. It is not an agency of the Ministry of Works and Transport, but it provides project management services to the Ministry of Works and Transport. Also, you have the National Infrastructure Development Company Limited, NETCO, a state enterprise of the Ministry of Works and Transport. And it is responsible for implementing major infrastructure, transportation, and institutional projects that comprise that comprises the country's capital stock. NITCO was specifically charged with procurement, construction, management and possibly financing of projects of national significance. You also have the Rural Development Company of Trinidad and Tobago Limited, RDC. And their website indicates that they, to expedite the development of infrastructure and community facilities in rural areas. And brand new, we have the Secondary Roads Rehabilitation and Improvement Company, I will hereafter call CIRIC. It's a new state enterprise, and according to the website, according to the press, sorry, not the website, according to the press, one, to receive technical assistance from the Ministry of Works and Transport, and two, to focus on local government roads and identify critical roads for repair. CIRIC has been allocated recently $200 million. I want to speak briefly about the Road Improvement Fund. We used to call it the RIF for road repair and maintenance. The government in 1993 found that there was an urgent need to embark on a significant road repair and maintenance program but they did not have the funds to do it. So they went to parliament and established the Road Improvement Fund, RIF, which was financed directly by the imposition of a road improvement tax of 5% on motor vehicle fuels. It was estimated then that the annual receipts would be 50 million and they would need it for about eight years to rehabilitate, repair, maintain the roads. And that fund was kept in central bank and could only be accessed exclusively for road repair improvement, road repair improvement and maintenance. It was not part of the consolidated fund. All this according to Hansa. A unit was formed to execute it. Eventually ended up with the unit named Pure, but it did not start off that way. It was named also, they had several names, including, I remember, NREP, NREP, et cetera. 
but Pure is a name they settled on and it continues today. However, the RIF was removed more than 15 years ago, but the Pure unit still functions. Back to our need for institutional improvements in the road infrastructure sector. Examination of institutional arrangements reveals the following. A, there are several independent yet related units within the Ministry of Works and Transport and agencies associated with road infrastructure. Some of them we highlighted earlier. The companies that is, as well as the divisions. B, individuals are not a statutory body are responsible for the private sector approval and recommendation process. Of course, that is a recipe for interference, perhaps some DSA corruption. C, there is no public access to state development policies and plans. The public has limited opportunities to genuinely influence decisions in the sector. And as a sidebar, both Pio and CIRIC have been allocated in the recent budget a total of $450 million for contractors to undertake road maintenance. We'll see the significance of that shortly. How, really, how it really should operate, in my thinking, I've put in this flow chart. You have the highways division, the premier institution responsible for governing the operations in the road sector, major roads. The highways division will procure the consultants. What will the consultants do? The consultants will do scoping exercises. They will do needs assessment surveys for so what, what stuff are required, and they will prepare terms of reference. They will so solicit participation, as you see on the right bar, the right box. They will solicit participation by persons who have an interest or are directly affected. The combination will result in the consultants or additional specialist consultants conducting detailed studies, and only then will contractors be procured. Why would Pure or CIRIC want to ascribe full liability for eventualities unto themselves? Or do these agencies think that they would always be able to pass them on to the contractor? So I ask the question, is Pure a super unit? When the unit now called Pure was formed in 1994, the minister had to report to parliament every six months on what they were doing, all the projects, et cetera, et cetera. A management committee, according to the Hansard rec records, was established at that time and included the director of highways as chairman. They also had the, a representative from the Trinidad and Tobago Chamber from Industry and Commerce, the director or deputy director of budgets of the Ministry of Finance, etc. cetera, about oh, well, five people. Who monitors the pure unit today? The unit does not have its own procurement system. Naturally, they are, they are subdivision of, under the well, theoretically, under the Ministry of Works Highways Division. So they must depend on others, usually NIPDEC. So I asked the question as published in the press recently. The Pure has undertaken, I don't know if it's the past year or the past two years, perhaps the past year, 300 projects, 
who were the awardees of these projects? Why are the salaries and other benefits much higher than other government divisions? Is there a separate retirement age for officers there other than the public service? Back to that question of eventualities. How do you establish liabilities? Checking with some of the legal people. One, you pinpoint the eventuality or the risk. Two, you show that it could have been prevented. And three, you identify who are the responsible parties. Let's look at this photo here. This is the northbound, the northbound carriageway of the Solomon Nutroy Highway in Chagonas. You see a red light, the yellow ones are street lights, but you see a red light that has nothing to do with the highway, but we see it. So what happens if you respond to that red light? Because you can see it from the highway. There have been numerous disasters, including fatal ones. Right? Presumably, as a result of this, who is liable? Look at this one here. Well, this is recent. This is the Debye roundabout. Look at the right lane here. The right lane, instead of deflecting as a roundabout should, the right end goes directly into the roundabout. But I want to show, I want to emphasize this one here now. This is a rural access road. Does that mean it does not deserve high quality construction of a bridge? This is a bridge over the Kaparo River, one of two rivers passing, passing through Shagonas. As you know, the Kaparo and Kunupia, you also have a a uh, smaller one called the Honda River. But skip this one, uh, this photo a minute. You see the big gouging of the area of the bridge here. Look why. Look at this photo why. Look at the abutment for this bridge. Two sheets of steel resulting in this gouging. Who is liable? The contractor? This is the, the recent one earlier this year, January, I think, was published of the, the Mosquito Creek, right? We are still to receive reports on the, this liability. Enough said. What is needed to correct ourselves? We require for institutional improvement a fair, predictable, administrative system. This means that engineering, construction, and consultancy firms will have the confidence to invest in skills development and in the future of their businesses and be able to draw on a reliable supply of skilled and enthusiastic graduates from our education system. These firms will then be able to position themselves to be regionally and internationally sought after for their expertise and the ability to deliver infrastructure projects. As an employer, this is what I would like for my, my young mentees, young graduates. So I ask the question, why are UE and UTT producing civil engineering graduates? Is it only to work in pure? Or if they can't get a job in pure, go overseas? Because that's the status of the industry at the moment. Is there a secret plan to dismantle the local private sector professional establishments? Going back to the, sticking with the need, sorry. 
three little points I wanted to jump out before we move on. Wasa excavations. We have a wicked cycle, poor road structure, excessive and excessive vehicle loading, then leaks in the, the underground water lines, leads to further deterioration and collapse of the road structure. Wicked cycle, that's one. Two. Highway flood. When I was a young grad, a young student at university, we learned that three things damage the road: water, water, and water. If water is allowed to enter the structure of a road, the road structure will be weakened and it will be susceptible to damage by traffic. What are we getting? Apparently, mill and pave operations only. Right now in, in, in Barataria, the whole area of Barataria, the set of milling and paving going on. I have not seen, and on the left here, this is a Benkoman bean. I'm not seeing the Benkoman bean being used to test the, the road deflections with, with passing vehicles or the falling weight deflectometer to determine the, the, the stiffness modulus or the bearing capacity of the road. Do students even, are, are the, the, the engineers even exposed to these things to determine the, the, remain, the life, the remaining life of the pavement and to guide what is required for maintenance? Here we are using milling to ensure that the road level does not exceed a certain amount. So we mill it to pave it. When we could be damaging the existing life of the of the road structure. Why don't we have pe periodic and detailed document inspection of bridge and culvert crossings? Now, I did not intend, and I do not intend to go into the, the different types of, of um, asphalt, cold, hot emulsions that we can use. But what I wanted to say at this point, pothole is a big problem. And pothole is not repaired by milling and paving. Yes, if it just start to alligator, alligator in as we call it, it just start to get little, little um, wears and tears, slight potholes. But when you have huge potholes in a road, you cannot mill and pave. But you can use bitumen emulsions. Do we know about? Long ago, when I was a little boy, I heard about the brand name Colas. The Colas emulsions, it's still used. Colas is a brand name. But like I said, this is not the, the, the subject of my presentation here today. I have only indicated this to show the need for expert engineering before the contractors are allowed to come in. So now I reach the meat of the presentation, my, the meat of my presentation, decision support tool for prioritization of national transportation projects. This can serve for not only road projects, it can serve for other transportation projects, transit projects, et cetera. One, one person responding to the, to the invitation to, to, to join today told me about his area is road safety auditing. And he raised issues with respect to road safety accident testing, road safety crash testing, and so on. Yes, certainly those can be projects as well with this tool. A brief background. Typically, a national transportation plan would provide a major road network master plan, which would serve as a guide to future road development and management. The objective of the road network plan is that it should seek to link major cities and towns, and also link areas of likely development. And more important to me here now, because when I graduated, we were in just a similar economic, economic challenge. So this, this is, if you like, my second, my second bite of the bitter pill, the line. There is need to balance investments for system expansion for example, road expansion and so on, different types of um, transportation systems 
There's a need to balance the expansion of those investments with preservation of what you have and maximizing the return from your past investments. So I've come up with a multi-criteria multi analysis strategy to be used as a decision support tool to support the decision makers in order to allow them to prioritize infrastructure projects within budget and time limitations. The tool is, uses subjective judgment, no doubt, to ease the practical problem of measurement and of course limited data and quantification of criteria values. Using selected criteria, a matrix is constructed on three pillars, socioeconomic, environmental, and political objectives. And this is the tool. So, you have the first pillar, socioeconomic return on investment. And it's divided into five components here. Of course, you can add others. This is not a fixed tool. It is how I have, it's a generic, um, suggest, a generic approach that could be added to or removed as you, as the, as the operators see fit. And it's not for an individual, as you'll see, it's for a group of people committing their ideas. So urgency of implementation, the indicator, degree of urgency. Economic viability, I'll explain each one in detail shortly. Economic viability, internal rate of return, can use benefit costs, et cetera. Relative investment costs, What's the project cost per GDP? Existing traffic equals per day. Financing, financial or financing feasibility, the self-financing capacity. Then you have a criteria score here. The criteria score is divided into five. Very high, high, medium, low, very low. Then you have a criteria weight. The criteria weight must add up to unit, to one. What I tend to do is treat it as a percentage and then divide, divide it accordingly. So your final figure here, your total score will always come up to be maximum five. The second pillar, functionality and coherence of the transportation network. And I have suggested here passenger demand, which is a percentage of total passenger kilometers, goods demand or freight traffic, percentage of total freight ton kilometer, and alleviation of travel bo bottlenecks, the percentage achievement, internet interconnection or accessibility, the extent of improvement. Then the third pillar, strategic or political concerns by the of the agencies and authorities involved, and that contains political commitment, measured indicated by policy statements, level of cooperation between the agencies indicated by a project preparation status, historical or heritage environmental issues as indicated by impact assessment, environmental or historical or heritage impact assessment and economic development impact, assessed impact on GDP. So important to know the criteria now, the key stakeholders are needed to improve the political and social point of view in terms of criteria weight. So this is really, this is really for a group of people, if you like, call them stakeholders, to help put, put their thoughts. I actually presented this some couple of years ago to the, there was an economic advisory council here appointed by government and um, some of them resigned. I think they, I don't know if that council exists, but I had the opportunity to present this and they thought it was, I got a good feedback from them 
when I presented it. But this is really not for one person, a group of key stakeholders putting their heads together. So the degree of urgency, the, the first going through each one of the pillars, this first pillar, the degree of urgency, typically the most urgent projects are those which will lead to highest economic losses if implementation is postponed, as well as the high, bring the highest benefit to the national economy and society as a whole. So the examples of my criteria, five, the highest immediate requirement. That is within the next, it's very urgent. You must do it within the next two years. If that is the feeling, number four, you get five. Very urgent, four between two, three and five years. Urgent between five and 10 years. Two, of course, these things may change up. Um, according to the desire. Economic viability, internal rate of return, excellent more than 15, you get five, et cetera, 13 to 15, four, et cetera, right down to one, the lowest. Relative investment cost. This is the, the project size in relation to the GDP. Again, I've suggested five more than a billion dollars. 750 to a to a billion, 750 million, to a billion, four, et cetera. Level of transport demand, or travel demand, some people will call it. This is an indicator of the relative level of existing traffic that will use the infrastructure. As an example, I'll put here five, existing traffic greater than 80,000 vehicles per day. I've used this deliberately, because if you travel on the Churchill Roosevelt Highway, one of the highest traffic um, roads in our country between the Grand Bazaar Interchange, or the Uriah Butler Interchange, and the Curep Interchange. The ADT, or the, the vehicles per day, is of the order of 80. It's currently projected by 2040 to hit double that, 160,000. So you can get an idea of scale in putting this together. And the lowest one, less than 10,000 vehicles per day, low volume road. Financing feasibility. This is an indicator of the project's bankability. It drifts towards non-recourse financing. The financing one, financial capacity of the project to undertake it, all operations, including maintenance, and loan repayment, the reliability, the reliability of the cost estimate to limit the risks, unexpected and <coughs> Right, so very high, high, et cetera. The next the pillar, relative importance of the person travel demand. This is an indicator of the project person volume transported in relation to the total person volume. So this is where, for example, United States collects data on, on, on passenger kilometer movement every year. We have never collected this type of information, vehicle kilometers or passenger kilometers. I have done it for the city of Port of Spain on a project and had to do it manually because it works with the multiplication of the road links and the volume for each link. So I've suggested 30% total passenger kilometers as the highest, and right down to less than 7%. Still in the second pillar, the goods demand, the importance of the rel relative importance of good demand, percentage of the total freight quantity tr transported. Also, we have never collected this freight ton kilometer. Alleviation of bottlenecks. This is an in indicator of the contribution of the project to the elimination of existing unexpected bottlenecks. Satisfactory, no traffic bottlenecks, adequate if traffic bottleneck is alleviated 70%, et cetera. I can tell you, I was reading a, a project at a conference in the city of Maryland 
they reduce traffic by they didn't use percentage, but they use they use they use their um, time savings, and they got fifteen minute time saving, and they had parties. The, the transportation agency had parties for reducing congestion by fifteen minutes. Here yeah, I'm just suggesting the percentage, which can ultimately be transferred into minutes. If it is a traffic project, remember this that I have put here is a generic approach. Interconnection of existing networks. This is an indicator of the extent to which the project will improve accessibility between regional and national networks. So one, if there is missing link, and we have a lot of problem with the land use planners have concerns about how the transport engineers and planners do their things because we have issues with missing links, connectivity between roads and communities and so forth. So five, if a missing link or if the missing link to the community ceases to exist, give it the highest value, right? And one, adverse effects on the rest of the network. We don't have time in this presentation to talk about our north-south linkage as far from the west to the east, north-south. Political commitment. This is an indicator of the degree of willingness to implement a specific project. For example, it's strong if the project is actually under implementation or high if the financing is secured. Three, medium if all engineering studies have been finalized. Two, adequate, meaning that the process for elaborate studies, they're underway or very low, no action. Um, again, on the third pillar, cooperation, this is an indicator of the relevant agencies and the authorities, cooperation between them. Is it satisfactory? Or are we in our own isolated towers? Do we get bonding? Is it town and country planning? The water and sewage authority? The schools? The Ministry of Health? The Ministry of Agriculture, et cetera, et cetera? These agencies? As, as relevant. Environmental, historical heritage issues, indicator of the possible impacts. No effects, minimal effects, tolerable or reversible effects, etc. And we talk about financing or we talk about the, 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 the economic impact as a result of the political concerns. Is the economic development impact strong, high, medium, low, or of no impact? That's the, the, the economic effect relative to the GDP. So this is it. This is what the, the table shows. When you put down your, your, your scores here, you put in your weights, point this, that, the other, up to one, when you add it, must come to one here. You multiply the two of them, your total score, depending on what it is, you have a, a decision to make. So it comes out like this. The classification, one, immediate implementation, two, short term, three, and what, one, two, and three, between four and five, again, my suggestion, between three and four, two, between two and three, category three, between zero and two, category four. In conclusion, dismantle the pure unit and return the, the highways division to its former premier status. The employees in pure could find their way back into units within the ministry or in the state, other state agencies if they desire. So return the highways division to its former premier status, including its professionals and sub-professionals. Upgrade the skills and capabilities as needed. Identify the relevant private sector professionals, including planning, engineering, social and economic experts, et cetera, and invite them to workshops to do this, to undertake the multi-criteria matrix evaluation for prioritization of national transportation projects. Based on the rankings of the projects, appoint appropriate consultants to conduct scoping exercises and needs assessment surveys. Then detailed studies 
to be conducted in accordance with the terms of reference that you would have developed out of the scoping and needs assessment, and then prepare tender documents for construction contracts. Consider NIP, NIPCO, NIPDEC, and RDC for procurement as needed with appropriate skill set upgrades accordingly. There is no need for the CERIC, this new company. NIPCO should seek to develop its skills in non recourse infrastructure financing for projects, develop that skill set that they have been asked to do. Focus on that. Everybody can be project managers or should not just be project managers. Highways Division to address the following with the assistance of the private consulting experts, road structure management with respect to vehicle loading and underground water lines. Contractors can do that. Consultants, road protection from surface water and groundwater and scientific procedures to determine their road guidance and bridge remaining life and the required maintenance guidelines. These are some of the literature I used in putting that doc document together. You'll get it when you check on the, the YouTube link later on. And I'd like to say thank you. These beautiful young people here on the left and the men on the right, we are all with the master himself. You see him, Professor Winston Sweet. Those are some of the faculty of University of Trinidad and Tobago, San Fernando campus there at his birthday celebration, but we sat in awe of being with the master, the master. And at the bottom left, they are with some research scholars abroad at a conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fulon. At this time, we invite all our participants on our platforms to send your comments and your questions. Um, firstly, I'd like to read one of the comments made by Dr. Trevor Townsend. The relative investment cost being a ratio of cost slash GDP would favor higher capital projects. The problem is that the risk to the economy is higher and the opportunities for wastage and corruption are also higher with higher capital projects. He also said, great presentation. Yeah, Trevor, I, I can't help agree with you, but I found it difficult to put it, put a generic thing any other way. If your suggestions are welcome or how you can put a project without have, knowing specifically what, what we are doing, or when the team meets together for looking at various projects, they can adjust, they can adjust that, um, that um, not only the ratio, but the factor, they can change the factor accordingly. I hope that helps. Can I ask a question? Yes, we'll take one of the questions from our physical platform here. Can you just say your name? And My name is Asad Mohammed. Interesting presentation, right? But in the model, isn't passenger demand variable that can be impacted upon by policy? Of course. But, but when we take that for granted, it means a whole range of policy and transportation options. Limits us. So we don't take that as a given. Well, <laughs> it can be an input. Right. but it can also be a measuring value. So okay. again, it has to be determined. So I'm trying to put something generic here. So if it is in fact an input, like a transportation planning study, then you will have to maybe take it out or put something else to substitute based on what you're looking for. I guess I'll follow comments. Yeah, this is really on my mind on higher engineering and higher development here. I, I for for this, this yes for this presentation for this, yes but, yes but of course this is a, a smaller part of transportation planning and transportation demand analysis and transportation investment in fact the problem one of the problems i would like to recommend or get your views on if in fact too much emphasis is on highways development and engineering and highways project and not in that in context of larger transportation planning. I consider that a very good observation, Asad. 
Um, and for those who didn't hear it, it's, it's why the emphasis on road and what drove what drove my my slant, if you like, in this way, because we are in a situation of serious economic challenge with respect to the road component of the transportation system. And that is why I drove it in that direction. Okay, we in I would like to endorse that point raised by my colleague in that moment. I think we often fall prey to focusing only on those things that give us possibly the greatest visible problem and the rest of the the highway step, not only the, the, the major roads, that we tend not to look at the distribution network. And not a lot of these problems are even more stark. For instance, the impact of flooding and the state and effect on, on bridges and culverts are more extreme in the so-called non-highway, highway is all the rules. <clears throat> but we tend to, to, to neglect, for instance, the, the road network system that feeds different the main, the main properties. So I think that that point that was made by my colleague, and the advantage here is that um, we have the benefit of possibly the most distinguished Caribbean um, transportation engineer um, you know, it's worth raising that one. And I, I am um, indebted to that contribution. I would like one other comment to make. <coughs> um, the, the presentation today, as I was listening to, and I'm seeing that um, people that think that, that we're focusing on, on some of these newspaper articles. With no comments. But I, I, I want to assure the audience, live and uh, listening to us, that the presentation is intended and adequately dealt with to deal with the road network system in the tropical region where we have specific problems, high water table, etc. And um, so that, in a sense, the contribution made <coughs> is applicable to most different all the road network systems in the Caribbean, and we have only focused on agricultural Caribbean. And I think that this is this is what is is is, is useful in the, the contribution to the by Professor Polo, and um, I can say on behalf of the of your teaching. But we have in, in store for you all a series of presentations that are going to be coming. We are going to try to aim for a minimum of one story. But already we are seeing that there is a demand for, for national and regional debate in engineering problems in the region that demand possibly. This tutorial system guide of the Stingwish Lecture Series that we will possibly be inclined, if not forced, to present almost every fortnight. And there are several areas. My colleague raised the question of physical planning, but we have other areas. The, the, the non-technical area, for instance, the, the, the procurement system in the society. We look at the, the education system. You know, are we training engineers? I think you into that. Are we training engineers for yesterday or for tomorrow? What are we what are we dealing with? So we, in a sense, we will try to cover by bringing not only resident consultants and experts. But from time to time, it reminds me of a, a younger student in Mona. We have something called the Maxwell Society, a junior for this. And whenever a distinguished scientist 
was passing to Jamaica. One of the things we sought to do was to invite such people to engage young scientists in Jamaica, in the physics and chemistry and math department, to come and listen. And I remember listening to Professor Blackett, one of the, 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 the experts who developed, I think, was the, 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 the discovered the electron or the positron. And, and I think that this series that we have initiated here, or the resume, the resumption, we intend to do just such a thing. So we are not only going to seek presentations from West Indian experts, but from time to time, we promise you that when we have distinguished foreigners, and when I say foreigners, I include particularly our distinguished diaspora. Just this weekend, I was talking to one of our distinguished um, um, engineers resident in the UK and, and seeking to get that person when next they come to Trinidad to give a guest lecture and so that we will get the benefit of not only our residents but our diaspora and also non West Indian experts who from time to time grace our shows. So that's what I will say. I think that I am pleased with what we have been doing so far. In fact, I'll also let you know that the line for opportunity to present is now high enough in other words, just a concern. In other words, more people are expressing interest to want to present their expertise to through this forum. I think I'd be proud to say that it is it is a while UTT took the initiative here. We must recognize that this exercise is not a standalone UTT book. <coughs> it draws together the lesson of the Association of Professional Engineers, APET, and the Board of Engineering of Trinidad and Tobago, the OETT, and the Faculty of Engineering at the University, the Sister University. University of, of, of the West Indies. And this is what I offer to you as a peek into what we plan to give you all in the coming months. Thank you very much. Before you take the, 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 the set of questions, pardon, I just want to respond to that point, and I'll respond this way. And that is very good about raising the issue with the rules. You always hear me. In fact, if you visit, <laughs> if you visit my website, you will see the transportation system with the roads and the transit. And before you came in, Dr. Mohammed, we had I talk a little bit on the transit and, and, and the road automobile domination. I introduced the thing to that. But I was sharing it someone. If I was appointed the minister of transport tomorrow, or worse, the minister's advisor. I would have a difficult time implementing in the strategy that I would take. Why? Because for the last 25, 27 years, the public has been accustomed having their way with the domination of vehicles and do as you, as you want to come now and to talk about public transport planning, to talk about transport planning, to reduce the vehicle speeds around the savannah, pedestrianization, cycling. You have to be a crazy person. That is why I started on, let's deal with how we solve some of the fundamental problems of infrastructure and introduce some of the other things. And as Dr. Thompson said, we could probably change, and you, um, Dr. Mohammed, we could probably change up some of the inputs and the factors that we use to, to um, and as Dr. Professor Sweet as well, to change up the form of analysis. That's what, that's what I want to get up. Over to you. <laughs> okay. Um, let's take some of the questions on Zoom. Right. So Dr. Townsend asks, would you be willing to share how this process would have directed different decisions read the point forward and highly? Sure. Straight off, Dr. Townsend, 
If you go back to the report prepared, if you go back to the report prepared by the by the James Armstrong, the James Armstrong team, of which I think you were you are a member, was a comprehensive team. First time I was learning about a socio-environmentalist, and the team had two socio-environmentalists. I read that report recently again, Professor Sweet. It said that the order of construction of that road, the segment dealing with the Mosquito Creek should have been done last. In the, the consultant said that, eh? James Armstrong report was quoting from the consultant's report. Why? Because of the very problems having they're having today. The, this, the order of decision making was wrong. The order should have been through penal debate, come back to Monday zero. Even if you didn't have money, as I've said in my own writing, even if you did not have the money for the interchanges, you could have done simpler type intersections and so on, and then come back after the road network was connected. You see a factor what in my thing was for road connectivity. After it was connected, Dr. Tongzen, then you deal with the one that is failing now because the study by the consultants recognized, recognized that the Mosquito Creek was questionable. Now that it is cut off, you still don't have the next connection. I hope that answers. Next one. <laughs> okay, Mr. Ilab, Ihab Ali, sorry. He says, thank you for the presentation, including the problem definition. One of the challenges with spending public funds is that funds tend to direct, tend to be directed to already developed communities, creating cycle that deprives poorer regions. This problem, this is the problem, is acknowledged in the UK, which is currently trying to distribute funding to poorer communities. Question, how can this tool be used to ensure poorer communities receive adequate projects slash funding? Right, thank you. Well, Ihab, thank you. Thank you, Ihab. Ihab is writing from, from Qatar. He is, he is logged in from former practice here with, the, with the, the traffic management branch. He is into road safety auditing. Now, the mere idea, I will answer you this way, Ihab, the mere idea we are bringing a structure to how projects are prioritized, that is how the money will be found. For example, if you come up and tell me you have $450 million budgeted for roads, how you come up with that? There must be a system to evaluate how you come up with that so that when it is, the, the, the project that you have in mind to do with those 450, when you assess them, you break them on the tear it up, I'm sure you'll find a lot of money to help the poorer communities. As I said, if you get into a program simply of pothole repair, using coal mixes and the hot mix as needed when the engineers do their thing, there are a variety of measures for dealing with the problems of failing pavements, not only milling and paving. The poorer communities could benefit a whole lot from the savings. Hope that helps. Okay, now I'll hand you over to Mr. Garvin Mungal, and he will handle all the questions that, or comments that we got from the YouTube platform. We just have a few short comments. Um, from Dr. Don Sanya, um, excellent questions and points. Uh, we have to get to the roots for us and eventually is liable. And the last point will prove true if we continue to import consultants. I don't know how to respond to that. For we, the local industry has a lot of competent people, and we are—I don't feel we are cheated, Professor Sweet. We just won, lost one of one of the found the lead the, the leaders of the founding engineering firm, um, Dr. Selvin Leong, passed away last week, and um, and those things impact on me a whole lot because they are the ones who created the self determination. You were part of all of that, the self-determination of our professionals. I consider it an insult to what you guys started to do at the university 
to transform our thinking to the locals and the regional profession. So when we talk about bringing in the, 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 the foreigners just like that, I have a problem with that. So we should be maximizing what we have. We should be exporting what we have. That's all I'll answer that. A short comment on the request of Sheldon Leon. Sheldon Leon was one of my the teachers, somewhere in form four or five at first. Um, and when he went away, back to the side of a thing, and when he left, the other side of the thing came to teach him. And I called him there. And I used to confuse him. But um, what I remember of Sheldon Leon is that he was a pioneer in the area, that area, of coastal construction. Before that, all the, the, the consultants dealing with that interface between the, the marine, the sea, etc., and the land was, in fact, left to foreign consultants. And he was a pioneer in setting up a company to deal with that. Not only that, he was not the only one, he had a couple of others. Uh, as a remember some of the people who came back to Jonah. They are PhDs. Yes, yes. There are a few of them. I remember Dr. B.G. Singer. Uh, I had an expert in those years when I when I, I mean so so I, I saw in the as a as a as a giant in my in my life, in my profession, and in his work in APEC as a senior engineer. And those fellows should all. They, they went into the public sector for a while and then set up companies with a bold step to set up a consulting company. <laughs> so I, um, I, I saw it in passing. And, uh, I, mean, I, remember I remember them because some people tend to minimize what teachers do in my primary and secondary school to influence our thinking and, and where we go. But, but this is true about building an indigenous capacity. We have to resume, we have to resume that exercise. Absolutely. In the passing of some of these words, we have to resume the exercise. It is not indigenizing. It's not going out in a little island by yourself and leave it. But it is making use of your indigenous building up that expertise. Right? I grew up in a household and my father was one of the first non white engineers in the country. That's why I told you. That's why I said I, I grew up in that household as, as a guy. So to see the disrespect painted out to the local engineering fertility is so, so for that. But not only that, your, your father belonged to that stream when in fact. The Ministry of Works in Trinidad was the expertise in road construction in the island. They had the island as a young student. In fact, the lab in Port of Spain was better than what we had in the university. It was the Port of Spain lab of works department and Dr. B.G. Singh's lab in Quebec. This is where you went. We took students of the to, to to see the development. And one of that was destroyed the dismantling of the expertise in the Ministry of Works. And I don't want to talk too much on this one. There are two other other um in those days when you want to be a serious engineer, you went to the Ministry of Works. Curtis Knight, Curtis Abe Mohammed. Yes, I learned at the feet of Curtis Knight. <laughs> Um, there, apparently, there's one I don't remember in Chinese who left the Ministry of Works and went to the States to be a professor. Um, that was the gentleman who started the Trinidad. And he left as a father, as a gentleman who started the Trinidad. Runners? No, no, no. The two of them formed the plan. Lenny said. Lenny said. Lenny said with a PhD. Yes. Actually, in, in highway planning. His, his PhD was in highway planning. That yeah. was the plan. You know that? Prior to 1970 in the Ministry of Works. Prior to 1970. 
Find kids and do engineering and etc. These are people who, 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 who forbid the city transition from the foreign colonial structure in the Ministry of Works Equivalent that transfer after 56, right? After uh, and then now 62. It was these people in the Ministry of Works that, that were the experts. They were the experts. We have lost them yes. and we have to. We have to go yes. back now. What's the point of that? It was the only thing was to dismantle the works. Well, it's happening again. That's why I commented on the yes. phone. Like but, but I'd like to take some more comments or questions from this guy. Building capacity from a central issue, and not only in civil engineering or highway, building cap indigenous capacity now is the challenge that is facing not only the universities of the region, but the, the politicians and the consultants. Building capacity is a central task facing us as engineers, especially if we talk about the role of engineers in development. So much. <coughs> no, no. Just one, just one more comment. Uh, the landscape plan. Um, PR is a unit of the Ministry of Income Transport, similar to any other department in the division. Okay. <laughs> okay, now we'll take one of the comments from Mr. Ihab Ali. He said that he agrees with your concerns that multiple agencies, such as Ministry of Works and Transport, Pure, CIRIC, etc., create challenges to properly delivering services. Personally, I worked in Ministry of Works and Transport and found that the expertise at the Ministry of Works and Transport are depleted over the years, which makes it difficult to carry out its functions. So I agree that the administrative structure needs to change. However, without reform of the Public Service Commission for hiring employees, expertise compensation, the expertise in the ministries will not approve, not improve, sorry. I hope you agree with the above. This is the root cause. Yes, Ihab, I do. I, because of time, I didn't expect this um, me to give examples, but just in response to that gentleman just now from Pew, let me give you two projects, very simple, two projects here. And I've written about one of them in the newspaper, of which I was attacked of, mis of misleading the nation. The first project, Lady Hills Avenue in San Fernando, a two-lane road previously. The intention is to develop the waterfront in San Fernando. And the very first project to develop the waterfront in San Fernando is dueling of two kilometers of Lady Hills Avenue that never had traffic. I would have thought, Dr. Mohamed, you are a land use planner. I would have thought that the planners would have jumped and said, what is going on here? Is the waterfront we're developing? Let's hold that thought for a minute. You have the San Fernando bypass between Marabella roundabout and Taruba Link Road roundabout, one kilometer only, the most traffic in the whole of San Fernando. Right? Right by right by um, that road there, two lanes. Shouldn't the project, even without doing this matrix, be the first project that you all is that? The only piece of the San, of the San Fernando bypass, north of it, north of this Marabella roundabout, you have a lot of lanes going up there, right up until they reach the um, former refinery. South of it, right down to, well, this, the past Gulf City, you have the dual, that little piece. But you find it important to dual Lady Hills Avenue. And these are the people doing it. Right. Is that the best we can do with, is that value for money? Where was the engineer, value engineering in doing that as part of a water? You want to start a waterfront project with Satimity Road, especially when on the waterfront, in the developed world, you go to Dusseldorf in, in Germany, you go to Toronto, they're taking down the highway on the waterfront. 
we put one upon four, four lanes. But the proof of the pies and the eating, people already park on both lanes when they go to do the, the jet skiing and so on and the what. So it, because there's no traffic there. I mean, that's a very important thing. You know, esteemed colleague Ava Nala and myself went to Barcelona to look and see how Las Ramblas met the sea. And what they did was, was at surface, low speed traffic, and took the high speed traffic out of the surface so you could improve the food finish, and they dropped too fast lanes. So we were exploring it at that time in the improvement of the scheme, how you could improve pedestrian access to the waterfront, right? While still treated with true traffic. But most of the traffic is a grid and slow speed balancing the pedestrian. So uh, uh, you're right to question why you would initiate a comprehensive waterfront project, a project that would potentially restrict the usefulness of the waterfront. But I think sometimes it's an easy project to get going without other people to demonstrate it. But you're doing something on the waterfront. I think that was the. Uh, okay. okay. That was the. Not that it was wide, but I think that was what you better. But we doing something. We got something done. Yeah. But don't try to sound like an engineer when you're doing non engineering thing yeah. to justify. <laughs> made a point to John Ray about uh, individuals approving plans about the statutory authority. The Highways Division of the Ministry of Works has limited powers under the Highways Act. It is not a regulatory authority. The regulatory authority is really the local government for infrastructure and buildings. There is no national authority in the Ministry of Works, either the building branch or the drainage division or the highways division. Those are historically referrals from local government to them because they don't have the technical capacity. In fact, <clears throat> um, the highways division only has jurisdiction on their roads, the main roads. And when you have to access that, so if you have a private development, but you need to access the one that you access in the press, they have no authority, legal authority to regulate road networks, infrastructure, and private development. That's local authority. They refer to that. In fact, the irony is that the Ministry of Works and its agencies have to get approval. PO or CERC, whatever it is, from local authorities anytime they work on local roads. Theoretically, they should get approval from them to do that. Right? The same with the drainage division. The drainage division has no statutory authority either in coastal areas or in development, except when it comes to major waterways and rights away of it. Those are referrals to the Ministry of Local Government. What is a statutory authority? Water supply and wastewater. You have to do them in parallel. But most of the other ones are passed through local government too. But question, the local government does seem to know that. But you're right. But the um the, the planning and facilitation and development act 2014 address those types of issues in terms of coordinating mechanisms and distributing and strengthening various authorities. So there, there has been thought into that including that implementing the provisions of that with local government could be the first important aspect of local government reform. It strengthens the technical capacity and it involves certain critical powers while establishing proper technical oversight, statutory oversight for complex buildings and complex infrastructure and so on at the national level, which doesn't exist right now, statutory. You know what happens? There's a mismatch. Yeah. All in the jurisdiction of the local authority, but no technical capacity. Yeah, very interesting. Indeed. Okay, another comment from Mr. Ali. You, you raised a valid safety concern. The photos should Sorry, the photos of the Solomon Ho Troy Highway northbound where the traffic signal are visible to drives on the main line, which is confusing slash hazardous to drivers. 
To prevent this type of problem, it should be mandatory to conduct a design road safety audit, RSA. The lack of horizontal deflection at the roundabout was another example where an RSA could, have, could help. RSA are proven to reduce collisions and prevent costly retrofit of safety features. Yeah, thank you here. My, my similar sentiments, I appreciate that, thank you. Any other? Any other? No? Professor, giving you the last say the master. Why wouldn't we call that the political or otherwise embrace your intelligence to solve most of these problems? But constructive criticism should be embraced. No, it is not. I have never. Right, he's being criticized in a lack of proper knowledge and information about what he was proposed without addressing what he was proposing. You understand why I said if I was put in the position, let's say I will give him the the powers as a minister or minister advisor, I couldn't do it because you, you will get the non-scientific lobbying for certain decisions. You feel you can tell people in Trinidad to re, re, reduce the volume in order for congestion to drop, you have to get 40% of the vehicles off the road. How are you doing that in Trinidad? The long-term vision and hard decisions. The easiest way for this is to build a road and fail it. And we want to maintain it. And then all the other things. So, what we have is we have the traffic and same traffic and we have to use the people soon. Because if we haven't thought of their solution with the transportation and climate change problems, we can't do the electric vehicles. Without talking about the travel demand, yeah. right? We talk about the use of that. No, no, no. People want to, they're hearing you, but they want to know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Mr. Graham King, he wanted to um he wanted to know who are the other contributors in the room. He said he recognized your voice, Dr. Asad Mohammed. Mm -hmm. So we do have Dr. Asad Mohammed with us here today in our physical platform. He is a former land use planner and he used to work at UE. He's now retired. Mr. Ali also says, Yes, I hear my former lecturer, Dr. Assad, in the room. So he's quite pleased as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, let, let me break it from Mike here, Dr. Fulong, if I may. Um, Trevor Townsend here. Um, yeah, Trevor, go ahead. And uh, first Just of all, a, hold on, that's about, be trying to, to hear you better. What's going on? <laughs> I don't know. No, it's not. That's all right. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Trevor. Go ahead. First of all, I'm I'm jealous I wasn't invited to the line. Um I see Azad there and Professor Sweet there, but you leave me out. I guess I'm being blacklisted by everybody these days. Um <laughs> but I just wanted to say two things, quick one. Um fantastic presentation. And Ray, thank you. I want to re remind that people don't know that you in fact had utilize this tool in 2010 in a project that we did looking at that same thing and um, that point 40 highway would not have been built the way that they eventually designed and give out a single contract if they had used the results of the work that we had done in 2010 using this tool. The second thing I want to say is that the multi-criteria analysis is used, we teach that finally after all the civil and environmental engineering students as part and parcel of their project analysis and project design work. The problem is that when they go out there into industry or into the ministries or into the agencies, it's not being used. But the students themselves have that, um, a basic skill system utilizing a, a, simple, um, a simplified version of the multi-criteria multi analysis to do, to do project analysis and project evaluation and project comparison. So it's not the problem of the young engineers coming out not knowing at least how to approach it. 
but it is that the structure and the institutions in which they are come into it do not utilize that skill set and do not utilize those tools. Ray muted. Okay. Thank you, Trevor. Um, I I didn't mean it. I hope I didn't realize it sounded that I was saying the students are coming out with without the skills. It's not that at all. I'm saying they are coming out with all the opportunities to apply the skills. That's what I was trying to get across. The, 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 the civil engineering market is very limited, if not dormant, with because of how things are managed and in the government sector. Government is the largest employer. And it's not contractors alone they are supposed to hire. They are supposed to hire the engineers, but strategically, and I'm saying that is not the entire approach to the distribution of resources. How uh, my my own firm as an employer, how do I how do I plan for my younger professionals? What future do we have? Not only me, but them and others like it. That's what I'm trying to get across. Right. And um Trevor was saying, in, in case you all didn't hear it, you were talking about Professor Sweet, you remember this when the project was done in 20. This this is a my presentation today was an excerpt from a project we did. Then the criteria now that's a one chapter of a report we did for NITCO way back in 2010. And we had workshops in NITCO on the same thing. What if that was applied? Would the would the point 14 highway have been done the way it has been done? That's what he's asking. Because he was part of of, of my team for, for doing that um that that project which makes a lot of sense but certainly i'm not i'm not um, coming down on this i'm coming down on the opportunities for the graduates that are coming out okay so give him um i'll just ask professor sweet to make some closing comments from you I have to say a distinguished audience because I am dealing with both the audience here with us in the I, uh, I attempted to say theater, the transmissions uh, room, and also those who are with us in other locations. I, I think that um, not only the topic that Professor Fulong chose to share with us, but the, some of the issues that were raised as a consequence of um, the discussions, and I, I particularly with Dr. Azad Mohammed, another um, professor from UWI, who made invaluable contributions. And as I said before, I don't want to take too much time repeating the same thing, but I am going to, to assist we in UTT jointly with APET and the Board of Engineering and UWI Faculty of Engineering. We intend to engage the engineering community, not only in Trinidad and the Caribbean, but to share with the wider engineering community some of the discourse. We believe that we are at a critical point in the Caribbean. It is not a time of tremendous construction work, but there's a time when there's need for consideration of a lot of construction work, both in terms of coastal works that have to be protected. And um, as, as, as I'd said, and, 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 and um, for long, we have a lot of roads that, that need repairing. And they are, they are, people are correcting, the, 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 attempting to correct them. 
as if they, the problems are only one problem, you mill and fill, and that we, we have to do more than that. Um, so I hope that you were treated today to uh, a gem in the presentation. And I promise, I think the next lecture, we have two lectures lined up for you. One is going to deal with flooding and, and um, the, 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 the damage, water management, flooding and that aspect. And the other one is going to deal with a very futuristic, we have to see, um, looking topic, the application of GIS to the entire range of the of not only the faculty offerings, in other words, all the various areas that geographic information systems are now being applied to, not only agriculture, but economics and a number of other areas. This and, and what we both in UTT and UWE have to offer now is as it were a new opening at the application of GIS systems in these areas. So that lined up those two areas are in your immediate future, as some people say. And I, um, I, I, I listened to the contribution of another um, UWI professor, Professor um, Trevor Thompson. And um, I don't want to telegraph what he, his area of interest is well known at least nationally, but um, he has called in here and made some invaluable contributions. Who knows he might be willing to come and join you or to present one of his, his um, um, interesting areas for discussion. The question of, of, of um, the introduction of the, the train as a mode of, of um, transportation but he has much more than that, that um, I'm not going to tell you about, but uh, I'm saying you know, I, am, I am now working on no less than about six different possible lectures, as they say, that are in your future. So we are talking about, we are looking forward for the rest of this year, up to June next year, to tie down people to come and give you Distinguished Lectures. The Distinguished Lecture Series initiated by UTT, Board of Engineering, APET, and, and UWI Faculty of Engineering will continue. And thank you very much for being with us here today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this point in time, we'd like to um, do a little vote of thanks and thank Dr. Fulong for his lovely presentation today. It's very thought provoking and it engaged our minds and we had a very exciting discussion. So let's hope that these um, discussions can fuel real and positive changes in our beloved country. And at this time, I'd like Dr. Fulong to receive a small token of our appreciation on behalf of UTT and the team that are hosting the Distinguished Lecture Series. So Dr. Fulong, they can't see you all day. <laughs> On behalf of you to do that before long, we would like to say thank you and special thanks from the PMCIS units. Thank you. So I can truly say that today's lecture was indeed a success. And we would like to say a huge thank you to all our hardworking UTT employees for their dedication in making this program possible. The teamwork and collaboration was indeed greatly appreciated by us at the PMCIS department. 
finally, I would like to thank our audience who came from both near and far, who spent their afternoon with us either on Zoom, YouTube, or physically with us at our Shagwana's campus. We are happy to have you listening and participating in the discussions. We look forward to you all joining us again for our next distinguished lecture of this series, the details of which are yet to be announced. So from our team at the University of the Trinidad of the University of Trinidad and Tobago, I wish you all a safe and wonderful afternoon. Goodbye. Thanks.